Ko te mea tuatahi, ka mihi atu ki a rātou ko a mene ki te pō, ko a whiturangi tia, ko ti rā ki ngā mate a kaironga i a tātou kato. Moi mai, moi mai o te atu. Ko a rātou tia rā te hunga mate ki te hunga mate, ko tātou tēnei e noho ora nei, mauri ora ki a tātou kato. Tēnā koutou kato. Nau mai, hara mai. Hara mai ki te kura tātai ture, o te whare wānanga o tūpoko o te ikaha Māui. Hara mai ki te... Ki te kauhau, tino whakahirahira o tēnei ahiahi. He hona re nui a hau, ki a hau, ki te tū, ki te mihi, ki te kaikōrero o te ahiahi nei. Te kaiwhakawā tumuaki o Aotearoa, kapurangi shan. Ngā mihi ki a koe e te rangatira. Ā. He tino tāo ngā koe ki te aoture, he tino hoa koe ki te iwi Māori, ki ngā tangata katoa o Aotearoa. Kua ki te mātou i te koe o tō Hinengaro, te kaha o tō ringa, te ngā kau aroha o tō wairua, Kei roto i o tuhinga, i o kōrero, i o mahi katoa. Kua ki te mātou i a koe, kei te tau ihu o te waka ture. Kei roto i te ruma koti, kei ko nei, kei ngā whare wānanga, kei ngā kura ture. Kei ngā hui o... Te hunga roa e Māori o Aotearoa me ngā wahi e tahi atu o te ture. Nā tō mahi, nā tō mahi i koa whakapakari te tariti o Waitangi, koa whakapakari i te kawa o te ture. Nā tō mahi ka whaka oho oho e a mātou katoa. Nō reira, tēnā koe e te rangatira. Ahako, he mihi poto tēnei, he mihi mai oha ki a koutou katoa, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Kia ora, Kāwan. Ka nui takumihi ki a koutou katoa. Ko Claudia Geiringer, ahau. I'm the co-director of the New Zealand Centre for Public Law. And I've been fretting for days about what to say to introduce Dame Sean Elias. I mean, how does one introduce the person who's not only one of New Zealand's most eminent jurists, not only, in fact, the first Chief Justice of New Zealand's highest court, not only a shining trailblazer for women in the profession, but simply the single best speechmaker that I, in any event, <laughs> have ever known. If Dame Shan were delivering this introduction, we all know how it would roll. She'd be eerily conversant with the person's life somehow able to portray all the key personal and professional influences on them and to reveal the layers of interconnectedness between them. She'd situate the person historically and intellectually and she'd perfectly encapsulate their essence, perhaps in a way they themselves hadn't previously understood. <laughs> There'd be just the right note of formality but leavened with charm and warmth and poignancy and intimacy and wit. There'd be the impeccably judged anecdote and then, of course, the exactly perfect quote pulled effortlessly from Dame Shan's prodigious mental library of literary and historical source material. And we'd leave this event feeling that we knew the person even if we didn't much at all, and that we loved them, even if we hadn't already. 
And so there I was, agonising about how I would introduce the Chief Justice. And it came to me, and what I thought was a moment of inspiration, that this is how I would introduce the Chief Justice, by speculating on what that introduction would look like if she were to deliver it. <laughs> and for a brief few moments, my dilemma was solved. Until it came to me in a blinding flash that the reason this ploy seemed so ingenious was that I'd seen it executed to perfection by, yep, you guessed it, <laughs> the Right Honourable Chief Justice Dame Sharn Elias at a conference in honour of Sir Kenneth Keith. At which point I gave up on any grand plans for this introduction and resigned myself to achieving three more workaday work goals. The first is to welcome you on behalf of the New Zealand Centre of Public Law and the Vic Faculty of Law, and to express our appreciation to Dame Shan for giving us this little piece of herself at a time when, perhaps more than ever before, everyone is clamouring for their share. The second is briefly to express my own appreciation for the leadership of the profession Dame Shan has shown during a truly inspirational career. And Dame Shan, I realise this is no funeral, but still, I have to say, I will miss your exquisitely rendered judgments, your discomforting ability to upend my received wisdoms, and most of all, your warm presence radiating out from across the road at number 85. And finally, my third task is to warmly welcome the Right Honourable Chief Justice Dame Shan Elias to the podium and invite her to address us on the topic Judicial Review and Constitutional Balance. In a mana, in a reo, in a ro rangatira, tēnā koto katoa. Kawan, e hoa, tēnā koe. Thank you for your mihi. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, amazing introduction. Um, I feel like going now. Um, <laughs> uh, nothing is going to be half as good. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to bore you all wit witless, and there won't be any intimacy about it, I can tell you. <laughs> I I've always hated the end game in chess. Uh, but the end game as Chief Justice is almost as tedious. Uh, it's also extremely time consuming, so it was very foolish indeed of me to be tempted into this address at such a time. The topic that I chose very hastily when I was being nagged at uh, for, uh, uh, because the flyer had to go out is uh, judicial review as constitutional balance, and I thought that offered plenty of wriggle room. A subtext that I'm not going to uh, develop is actually the place in our constitutional order of the High Court. The High Court, as you know, is the superior court of inherent jurisdiction, which has the obligation of maintaining the rule of law. That requires it to pay close attention to power wherever it's found. The High Court, which has inherent jurisdiction, has also the especial responsibility, which was once described by Lord Diplock, as being to adapt its processes to preserve the integrity of the rule of law despite changes in the social structure methods of government and the extent to which the activities of private citizens are controlled by government authorities. In any hierarchy, such as the courts are, it's very easy to get rapture of the heights. But it's the High Court that maintains constitutional balance and the jurisdiction needs to be carefully conserved and if I have a parting plea, it is take care of this jurisdiction. The rule of law obligations described by Lord Diplock were concerned with public power. He's generally credited with having much, done much to popularise the term public law, even though he himself acknowledged 
that the appreciation of the distinction in substantive law between what is private law and what is public law has, in fact, been a latecomer to the English legal system. Now, it might be a bit bold, even a bit churlish, at a lecture hosted by the New Zealand Centre for Public Law to say so, but one of the points I want to make is that judicial review and the obligations of the courts to maintain the rule of law are not confined to supervision of the actions of government authorities. They are concerned not only with public power, although that is a common misconception. The dispersal through privatisation of public power and the great powers now exercised by private bodies and individuals in an era of big data may make it important to reconnect judicial responsibility with the broader conception of the rule of law and what is constitutional. And judicial review itself is part only of procedures available to the courts by which they supervise compliance with law. Now, I don't want to diminish the huge achievement of bringing government actions securely under the rule of law. It has been the major development in law in my professional lifetime, although it started a little bit before that. It is still surprising to me to recollect how little the project had advanced at the time I studied constitutional and administrative law with Dr. Northey in Auckland in 1967 under the new and alarming case method he had introduced. Much of the development had arisen out of legislation which promotes good government, such as the Official Information Act, so I don't suggest it was entirely judge-led. And the climate of openness and justification that that sort of legislation brought in, and the standards democratically identified in the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act have changed the culture and method of government. Discretion is now systemised by policy statements, manuals and other forms of soft law which protect against arbitrariness and provide fair process. Checks are provided within government and by adjudicators who observe natural justice. So effective redress for administrative error for most people doesn't entail access to the courts. Such non-judicial systems to secure good government may well allow more space for reasonable differences in application in the uh, in application of the supervisory jurisdiction, although that's not something I want to develop here. But despite this tremendous achievement in the in the development of administrative law, the need for the safety net of the supervisory jurisdiction provided by the independent judicial authority of the state remains, and changes to government and the power of private actors turn up new applications. If, for example, the lives of real people are increasingly affected as they are by soft law, the supervisory jurisdiction responds in application of the obligation under the common law to follow power. In addition, I wonder whether in the success of the development of administrative justice, we may have lost an older sense of what is constitutional and therefore the province of the supervisory jurisdiction, at least outside the area of human rights, where of course we have had a constitutional repositioning. But we may have lost familiarity with common law principles and methods which could well need to be pressed into service again to meet the challenges of the future. And I want to touch on some of these ideas, although very tentatively, because I have to say that these are not fully thought out positions. But first, I want to start with some general points. First, a disclaimer about judicial uh, importance. It shouldn't be necessary to say that I don't put courts or judicial review or other judicial processes at the centre of the Constitution or as the pr principal bullock against abuse of power. I have, however, learnt from experience that it's necessary to make this point clearly whenever talking 
uh, in, uh, uh, about such matters. I don't count judicial check as other than auxiliary protection in a constitutional order that's working properly, and it is weak protection. But although weak and peripheral to, watch, to what, much of what is done, it is essential safety net. Judicial supervision is a function that is vulnerable if it isn't valued. The vulnerability in a constitutional system like ours comes in part from legislation which excludes or manages the jurisdiction of the courts, and there's certainly been a renewed enthusiasm for such legislation in recent years. Such privative clauses as well as earlier exclusions, such as in employment matters and arbitrations, create asymmetry in the legal order that I think will need to be reconsidered from time to time. But supervisory jurisdiction is vulnerable too to loss of judicial nerve. Cheryl Saunders, the distinguished Australian constitutional scholar, points out that the tension between executive and the judiciary in a parliamentary system, in which she says parliament is sometimes an unwitting bystander, accounts for judicial self-restraint in all jurisdictions, whether or not explicitly described in terms of deference. And it underpins what she describes as the tug of war over privative clauses, which is a recurring feature of, co of common law public law. So talking about the constitutional role of the judiciary and checking power has always seemed to me to be a good idea, and I was told to do so by Sir Geoffrey Palmer when I became Chief Justice. Like other aspects of our opaque constitution, it needs to be understood and valued by all in our society if we aren't to sleepwalk into its erosion. Another reservation I want to flag at the outset is some of the pitfalls in judicial exposition of constitutional fundamentals, particularly in a system like ours, in which, lacking a primary text, you have to work hard at understanding and explaining the Constitution, and it is inherently contested. Now, I'm a believer in the value of common law methodology. It has great uh, virtues in explaining the exercise of judicial authority in reasons which must convince, or else they won't long endure. The common law, as its great exponents have always acknowledged, is a method of change. It's a form of institutionalised discourse or method of argumentation, and its arguments survive only until defeated by a better, usually responding to different social conditions and developments in human knowledge. The common law method, then, is intensely contextual. That makes those who long for certainty and who like the security of rules very nervous. But it is part of the strength of the common law. The virtue of public reasoning in court judgments is that it lays out all sides of a matter. At times, such public reasoning has slowed down significant controversies that might have been destructive of social harmony and allowed the political processes to catch up. The common law methodology, however, must be careful, incremental, and modest. And if that methodology is not adhered to, there is trouble. In his wonderful Maccabean lecture, Lord Goff spoke of the pitfalls for judges that come if they uh, pitfalls for judges that cause trouble if they don't avoid them. Now, I have to say that few judges, in my experience, do manage to avoid them completely, and I know that I've succumbed occasionally, and I do think that perhaps they're pitfalls also for academics. Now, although Lord Goff is too polite to say so, the pitfalls he identifies arise out of vanity. There is, he says, the temptation of elegance, a judgment so beautifully expressed that it deflects critical clear-sightedness. 
There is oversimplification with its dangers of under-inclusion and failure to grasp the complexities and difficulties of a working legal order. There's the fallacy of the instant complete solution, which treats law as an expression of will and neglects the historical context and movement from which it can't be divorced. And there is the dogmatic fallacy of being unable to see the principles for the rules. Now, all of these temptations succumb to, at times, have caused confusion, at least for a time, in the application of the supervisory jurisdiction and some real harm, I think, at times. And to this list of pitfalls, I would add the temptation of over-concentration on the latest case or the latest law review article. Principles don't often emerge clearly, except, I'm afraid, by reading a lot of law. And restatements of leading authorities are rarely, in my experience, improvements in exposing the thinking that led to the innovation in the first place. Original thinking is usually the best springboard for fresh thinking as to whether authorities remember, uh, remain uh, compelling in the constant reappraisal that is the method of the common law. So with those general matters of background, I turn to the Constitution within which power is exercised and supervised by the courts. It is the background in, within which judicial review operates. And because the Constitution of any country is the product of its unique history and constitutional and legislative instruments and doctrines, the different constitutional background makes judicial review different in each jurisdiction, no matter how closely related. So although in New Zealand we've always been comfortable in looking to comparative law for help, some special care is necessary in this area. So, Judicial review in New Zealand differs from that in the United Kingdom in being so far resistant to a strict division between public and private law, which treats judicial review as concerned with public law only. And that's a matter I want to come on to discuss a bit further. Judicial review in New Zealand differs from Australia significantly in the continued requirement of jurisdictional error in Australia. It's true that in recent decisions, the High Court of Australia has expanded the categories of error it treats as jurisdictional so that our law may be converging in this respect. But the reasoning that it is used is tied very closely and very technically to a stricter separation of the judicial power than is applied in New Zealand and by the complications of federalism. It is rather startling to have cited to us in New Zealand, I think, human rights cases, in human rights cases, decisions such as Momchilovich and the Queen, which turns on considerations peculiar, in fact, which, yes, uh, not only considerations peculiar to the judicial power of the Commonwealth, but peculiar uh, considerations um, <laughs> under the Australian Constitution and under High Court doctrine. The Canadian constitutional background also makes it difficult to apply without care decisions of the Canadian Supreme Court. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Section 35 of the Constitution dealing with the rights of Aboriginal people of Canada are fundamental law. In addition, the courts in Canada haven't shrugged off the complications of jurisdictional error and have developed elaborate standards of judicial review which have been subjected to sudden adjustments and uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has another case reserved at the moment in which they're going to revisit the categories. We have in New Zealand taken a simpler path, perhaps under the influence of Lord Cook of Thorndon, uh, and uh, perhaps Sir Kenneth Keith, both we were very lucky in our time to have had outstanding public lawyers, even though I don't really think there's such a thing as public law, um, to, um, uh, uh, to, to lead the way. 
A number of recent cases, however, in which more complication in levels of review uh, appear show that simplicity remains a struggle and that the allure of tests and rules is a strong one. And there are a lot of academic voices raised in support of that. The old notion of the Constitution was that it consisted of all the laws. Now, we don't generally think of the Constitution in that way today. Rather, even in a system uncontrolled by a primary text, the Constitution consists of that which is fundamental to the legal order, and there's plenty of disagreement about what that is. The great legal historian Maitland considered that the constitution of any country can only be understood from its general law and only as a snapshot at any particular time. He thought only those who know a good deal of English law are really entitled to have any opinion as to the limits of that part of the law which it is convenient to call constitutional. As he explains, there has hardly been an area of law that at one time or another hasn't been of constitutional importance. Land law in medieval times, criminal law in the struggle between the king and parliament in the 17th century, the liability and tort of the servants of the crown, and the grants of writs of habeas corpus despite the return that the detention was approved by the king were the principal sites of constitutional contest long before administrative law dominated legal issues of power. On Maitland's view that a sense of what is constitutional turns on where the seat of constitutional contest is at any time, the constitutional is to be found in general law. Dicey, then, was right. But Dicey also thought that enacted laws were not ranked according to importance because of the dogma that allows the Dentists Act to trump the Act of Union if it conflicts. Well, I think that's hard to reconcile with reality. Even Dicey agreed that st statutes weren't equal in importance, and there are plenty of pointers in our law to suggest that they are not so regarded generally, including the legislative classification of ancient imperial statutes as constitutional in the Imperial Laws Application Act, and the classification of modern legislation as constitutional in the Cabinet Manual. The Supreme Court of the United Kingdom has attempted a classification of its own a few years ago, to which it also added principles of the common law fundamental to the rule of law. That, it said, was our constitution. If Dicey is right in the view that the Act of Union would be treated as repealed pro tanto, if inconsistent in some respects with the Dentists Act, because of the fundamental dogma of the absolute legislative sovereignty of the king in parliament, uh, is he right? Many would doubt it. And good sense, well, I should have said good sense should preclude the issue arising, but one wonders where it'll all end up in the UK at the moment. <laughs> but it does seem to me that the approach taken by Lord Justice Laws in Thoburn and Sutherland City Council is likely to receive close attention if that sort of issue ever does emerge. And a straw in the wind may be the decision of the UK Supreme Court in the HS2 case. In the case of collusion between two important statutes, the Supreme Court was clearly reluctant to accept that Section 9 of the Bill of Rights of 1689 could be impliedly repealed, even by a statute as significant as the European Communities Act 1972. If some ancient statutes, themselves expressions of common law, are identified in modern legislation as constitutional, and if the Cabinet Manual for more than 20 years has classified a number of modern statutes as constitutional, 
Is it so very revolutionary to think that some principles of the common law run so deep that they could not be discarded legitimately, as Sir Robin Cook and now the Supreme Court of the UK have suggested? Sir Anthony Mason, the former Chief Justice of Australia, suggested observance of democratic fundamentals would be in that category. Others would place judicial review in the classification of what is constitutional. And that is why clauses that ask the review jurisdiction of the courts or modify them are treated with such deep reserve by the courts and why Section 27 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act recognises the right to seek judicial review of decisions affecting rights of interests as, as a human right which is fundamental. In 1980, Lord Justice Diplock said that the British Constitution was based on the separation of powers. He was criticised for doing so at the time. It seems to me, however, that a requirement of a distinct judicial authority inevitably arises out of the conception of the rule of law. If law is to rule, judicial authority to say so is necessary. The judicial power of the state must be independent of the other branches, and on this view, the supervisory jurisdiction of the High Court is bedrock, constitutional bedrock. Judicial review is supervisory jurisdiction. In respect of government and public entities, it was described by Sir Gerard Brennan as neither more nor less than the enforcement of the rule of law over executive action. It checks the boundaries of power conferred on others. It is not original decision making. It doesn't usurp the authority conferred on others. It is a procedure by which the High Court, the Court of Inherent Jurisdiction, keeps those exercising power within the boundaries of their lawful authority and requires them to act fairly, for proper purpose and reasonably. Judicial review is available to challenge either the exercise of a statutory power or failure to exercise it. Questions of vires and jurisdiction account for a great part of judicial review because those exercising power must have the power they purport to exercise and keep within it. And they usually turn on questions of statutory interpretation which are entirely familiar judicial territory. But the scope of judicial review is not confined to such questions. There is a spectrum in which the relative institutional competencies of courts and political decision makers vary according to the nature of the question in issue, and discretion to exercise judicial review follows assessment of where on the spectrum judicial competence is seen to fall. I don't regard that as a question of, of jurisdiction. I regard it as a question of um, whether it's appropriate to exercise a jurisdiction the courts undoubtedly have. Lord Hailsham warned against the use of rigid legal classifications in exercising the supervisory jurisdiction. He said the jurisdiction is inherently discretionary and the courts the court is frequently in the presence of differences of degree which merge almost imperceptibly into differences of kind. Mark Aronson and Matthew Groves, the Australian academics, uh, public law academics, echoing similar statements made in his time by Felix Frankfurter, say that the scope and grounds of judicial review have a degree of indeterminacy whose resolution in individual cases cannot be achieved by reference to doctrine alone. And as Sir John Laws pointed out in an article about reasonableness in public law many years ago, it is one thing to say that reasonableness means different things in context, it's quite another to say that there are circumstances in which unreasonable exercise of power is not amenable to judicial review at all. It seems preferable to regard the basis of review as remaining constant, 
what, what is reasonable, but its application as contextual. We have expansive procedural provisions for obtaining judicial review. They're now contained in the Judicial Review Procedure Act. And we have a long history of judicially reviewing bodies which control important activities even if they are not statutory bodies. So, and we have also had no trouble in saying that although a matter may be dealt with by judicial review, it may also be dealt with, with by a declaration under the Declaratory Judgments Act or uh, on, a, uh, on um, an action brought for that purpose without resort to judicial review. So we don't have a procedural snarl. Whatever it takes to get the issue before the court, the courts have the means to achieve. I just want to say something briefly about the history of administrative law because it still amazes me to remember how recent many of the foundational cases in administrative law are. Although when I say that, young people look at me as if I am very old. But when I studied administrative law in 1967, Rich and Baldwin was only three years old. And most of the seminal cases mentioned by Lord Diplock in O'Reilly and Mackman had yet to be decided. Indeed, the great House of Lords case of M and the Home Office, which finally brought the prerogative in England under the control of the courts, wasn't decided until 1993. It was described by Sir William Wade as the most important constitutional case in 200 years, and by Sir Stephen Sedley as the last prize of the Civil War. <laughs> Before then, uh, I'm pleased to say, the prerogative of mercy had been judicially reviewed in New Zealand in Burt and the Governor General. Uh, uh, Mr Justice Cook, for the court, took the view that the mere fact that a decision had been made under the prerogative didn't exempt it from judicial review, provided only the subject matter is one the courts are competent to deal with. The court accepted that the exercise of the prerogative to ensure that elementary standards of fair procedure had been followed was appropriate for court review. It expressed the view that it might be right to exclude any lingering thought that the prerogative of mercy is no more than an arbitrary monarchical, monarchical right of grace and favour. As developed, uh, uh, Justice Cook said, it has become an integral element in the criminal justice system, a constitutional safeguard against mistakes. So, and although the court concluded that in that case the absence of formal procedure wasn't shown to be unfair at any rate at present, uh, it sounded the warning that it is inevitably the duty of the court to extend the scope of common law review if justice so requires. I won't go into the implication of the rather Delphic uh, decision of, the, of Anna's Minnick, but I do want to tell you um, that um, we are bound together, Anna's Minnick and I, uh, because the very first case I ever appeared in um, was one in the High Court, in, or the Supreme Court as it was then in Auckland, when walking up the hill to court, uh, when I was prattling on about the work I'd been doing on the law, my not-so-learned leader uh, said, I think you'd better argue the law. And um, we went in front of, um, uh, and it was on the application of Anna's Minnick in New Zealand. It, had, it was 1973 when we were arguing this, and the case had only just been decided. Um, the, the, the judge I was happy enough to encounter was actually Mr Justice Cook. Um, <laughs> mine was an extremely nervous debut, but of course I was pushing on an open door and the judge knew all about it. Um, so, although, uh, although he was overturned by the Court of Appeal, but not, not really on the law, more on its application. Um, <laughs> 
Anyway, last week in the case of H, the Supreme Court, um, uh, well, when, when uh, Justice Cook uh, was in the Court of Appeal, of course, he had the opportunity to cement in place um, the decision he had reached in Car Haulaways in, um, in the case of um, bulk gas users, which is still the leading authority, as last week the Supreme Court confirmed. Uh, in interpreting a privative clause as ineffective to ask judicial review for error of law, which had caused the statutory process provided for in the legislation to miscarry, or to fail. Um, so, um, in bulk gas, Cook said that if an authority applied a wrong test and so didn't exercise its true powers, a privative clause would not apply because, following Annas Minnick, there would be lack of jurisdiction in the sense recognised in Annas Minnick. Now, it has to be said that I think bulk gas pushed Annas Minnick further than uh, the words in Annas Minnick, but in the end, in the UK, in O'Reilly and Mackman and some of the other cases, the ground was caught up. But the other point that was made by Justice Cook in the bulk, bulk gas case uh, was that the um, declaration in that case um, uh, left in the privative clause in any event wouldn't have precluded a declaration as to future application. And, um, uh, and the power to grant declarations uh, overlapped the part under the Declaratory Judgments Act and under the, um, uh, in terms of the judicial review procedure. I wish we'd read the case. You know, I'm always telling people to read the case. I wish we had read the case before one of our recent decisions was at Taylor, where it would have been very useful uh, to cite that. Uh, because it was bang on point, I think. Now, I want to return to speak about the extent to which the supervisory jurisdiction in New Zealand is concerned with public law. Sir Robin Cook distinguished the private-public div divide adopted in O'Reilly and Mackman in England on the basis of the different procedures available under the then Judicature Amendment Act in New Zealand and the English uh, procedure. He also held that declaratory remedies in New Zealand for breach of natural justice continue to be available outside the judicial review procedure. But I wonder really whether the better course might simply have been to reject the distinction between private and public power for the purposes of judicial intervention, as inconsistent with the history of judicial jurisdiction and the rule of law for reasons given by many academic commentators, starting with Sir William Wade. Uh, and uh, that, at least, that direct rejection uh, might have preempted some arguments that seem to be being run at the moment that recent changes in legislation to manage the process of judicial review, which imitate some of the uh, procedural restrictions. Uh, in O'Reilly and Mackman, in the procedure there, uh, uh, have overcome its distinguishing. Um, so uh, I think um, it, cases such as Problem Gambling and the New Zealand Māori Council and Fuchs, which are recent cases, may suggest that some public law context, which suggests that some public law context is required for judicial review, may need uh, second thoughts. The public-private, I'm not going to be sitting on any more cases, so I thought <laughs> I would say something like that too. The public-private division may, may also have contributed to the very narrow grounds of review suggested in Mercury Energy. Uh, a very tentative decision, but um, uh, still um, uh, used. In the case of Ruranui, the majority, um, where the Supreme Court looked at this, the majority reasons explain that none of the parties in that case sought to enlarge the categories used in, used in mercury energy and were uh, content to 
uh, argue the case on that basis, and so the case did proceed on that assumption. Uh, but um, Mercury Energy may be looking increasingly ragged, uh, and it may be contrasted with some of the approaches taken in Canada uh, towards uh, liability attaching to public actors, um, uh, even if, uh, uh, despite uh, the absence of any overt public law responsibilities, uh, private um, uh, public actors being subject to duties in particular in equity. Uh, the impossibility of a clear distinction between private and public law is seen in cases arising out of the liability of local authorities in negligence, including for non-feasance. In cases such as Finnegan and Recorden, in which senior counsel Ted Thomas to, to this day thinks that that was a private law case, while I, as his junior, always thought it was a public law case. <laughs> um, uh, and in cases concerning native proprietary interests in Canada, Australia and New Zealand, in that last group, the Crown has been held to, to be a fiduciary, to owe equitable duties in respect of dealings in the property of native proprietors in Gurren and the cases which have followed it in Canada, and in Wakatu proprietors in New Zealand. In a later Canadian Supreme Court case, the Court described the multitude of relationships between the Crown and Aboriginal people, which meant that their interests couldn't be put on the same footing as a government benefits programme. That would give rise to public law remedies only, but the, uh, but the proprietorial or quasi-proprietorial rights raised considerations in the nature of a private law duty. In Wick and Queensland, Justice Brennan, who dissented in the result on the basis of statutory interpretation, still accepted that when discretionary power is conferred for exercise on behalf of or for the benefit of others, fiduciary obligations may arise on established equitable principle or by analogy. It's not inconceivable, then, that the response of the legal order to the special claims of native populations may continue to require further consideration under principles of equity and common law, as well as in public law. A distinction between private law and, and public law is difficult to apply because functions are rarely able to be classified as starkly, leading to suggestions in some recent cases of exceptions for public law context. Indeed, all legal interests which depend on state enforcement may be said to sound in public um, interest. The labels public or private don't seem to me to provide any principle on which to base the distinction, and it's not easily reconciled either with the form of our judicial review statutory procedures or with the general procedures of the courts available to control power. In Bajant's case, you'll recollect that Justice Galt suggested development of private common law remedies as more appropriate than the provision of public law damages, and there may still be room for movement in this space. Sir David Williams showed that administrative justice is not an island, but is connected to the mainland of the common law. More attention, I think, needs to be paid to these connections. There is a risk to both public law and private law if public law is seen as a part Power and its abuse are familiar problems in law, not confined to public law. In Ridge and Baldwin, Lord Reed drew heavily on private law cases con co concerned with control of power, and many of the principles applied in administrative law were developed in tort, contract, company law, labour law, criminal law, and equity. Modern administrative law, as Sir Anthony Mason has remarked, has roots in private law. 
That is not to say that there is not value in considering the role of what is public power. All such power is necessarily limited because unfettered discretion is a, in a constitutional order based on the rule of law is, as Sir William Wade said, a contradiction in terms. But so too is all power exercised over and on behalf of others, whether in an incorporated society, a company, a club, or perhaps through contract, especially where there is disparity in bargaining power or unconscionable dealing. We should be open to these ideas. A distinction between self-regarding and other-regarding uh, capacity or power might provide a more principled basis for judicial review. Other-regarding powers may be ones which must be exercised in the interests of others or in the wider public interest, and it's at least consistent with the overlap between equitable principles and those applied in judicial review. But even then, it may be advisable in a world increasingly conscious of interdependence and disadvantage, as well of, as of the huge resources able to be mobilised by the state and private actors to leave room for development. I'm thinking here of Mr Pickles, uh, of whom Mike Taggart uh, wrote so well, and Jaws, uh, the character written about by, Lord, uh, uh, by uh, Sir Stephen Sedley in his Hamlin lectures. <coughs> both of them um, exert power, both of them are the subject of control by law. Sir David Williams in his writing and Justice McLaughlin in the Supreme Court of Canada have each recognised the reality that governmental power is of a quality that re requires special attention. David Williams wrote about that in 1984. It may not be quite as self-evident today that big government uh, wields such unique powers because we know that natural persons and commercial organisations can now aspire to positions of equivalent dominance. So it may be we need to develop ideas of power which are less hitched to classification of the power as public or private, transcending the continuing problems of characterisation in the contracting state and recognising the realities of power exercised through the con contract. In the meantime, where public bodies contract the power they exercise must be for public purpose, as the Canadian Supreme Court has said. And if that sort of reasoning applies not only to proper purpose, but also to natural justice, then that's where I think the recent decision of the Court of Appeal in problem gambling may need to be treated with some caution. Judicial review doesn't entail the court substituting its judgment for that of the primary decision maker as long as there is scope for justified exercise of choice. But if a judge considers that only one reading of a statute is correct, or if one outcome only is available to a decision maker acting reasonably, as I thought was the case in the Helen case, then the judge must intervene. And in exercising this constitutional function, the courts can't defer to assertions of political authority, the public good, or financial constraints. So, in conclusion, public law today occupies space that until comparatively recently was the province of constitutional law alone. Until 1940, there was no such subject as administrative law taught in the law schools of New Zealand. The judges and the profession were against it. They considered there was no such special branch of the law, and that if distinct from general law, at most it was but an aspect of constitutional law. Sir Michael Myers, as Chief Justice, eventually acquiesced in the inclusion in the cur curriculum of what he said the law professors are pleased to call administrative law. 
two comments can perhaps be made about the extent to which we've moved on from this Dicean complacency. First, it strikes me as ironic that the procedure of judicial review, which preceded the development of the modern administrative law, seems today to be so closely associated with it that we have forgotten its older provenance and the extent to which it is still available to ensure observance of law, including in relation to areas generally thought of today as private law. Secondly, subject only to some adjustment for the march of rights, administrative law seems largely to have eclipsed constitutional law. Now, in a constitutional setting like ours, that means there is a risk that in judicial review, we start too often in the middle instead of at the beginning with what is foundational in the legal order. There may be some signs of repositioning. Although in 1960, Professor De Smith thought that constitutional law and administrative law occupied distinct provinces, if also a with a substantial degree of common ground, the latest editions of the text have suggested more convergence as the emphasis on ultra vires as the foundation for judicial review has waned. It seems to me that the supervisory jurisdiction may be best understood as constitutional review, which is observed by public and private actors alike if they have power to affect the rights or interests of others. Judicial review to ensure that such power is not abused does not weaken but strengthens good administration and the rule of law. Felix Frankfurter once warned against an undue quest for certainty in relation to administrative law. And Sir David Williams suggested that in the long term, the courts would help in the development of a more ordered legal system if they intervened where intervention is constitutionally desirable. Now that approach doesn't lend itself to tests and bright lines, but if it encourages better constitutional sense, Mr Pickles and Jaws and all who exercise power over others may yet join administrators and officials under the rule of law. Norera tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora tato katoa. Further to Claudia's expressions of anxiety at the introductory part of the lecture, it falls to me to have somewhat more distress and anxiety at the very conclusion. But I propose a vote of thanks. I propose a vote of thanks in honour of the Right Honourable Dame Sharn Elias, the Chief Justice of New Zealand from 1999 until this March of 2019. Etu ki te kei o te waka, ke pakia koe e na naru o te wā. I say those words because they were uttered in honour of the late Aparana Mahawika. Stand at the stern of the canoe and feel the spray of the future biting at your face. That whakatauki was the theme of a hui of the Māori Law Society in September 2015 at Waitangi, which the Right Honourable Dame Shana Elias attended together with the Honourable Dame Lowell Goddard, two pioneers in our profession in 1988, 31 years ago, when appointed as the first women Queen's Council in New Zealand. Time weaves through the perspectives the Chief Justice has brought to us. Whether at occasions of judgment in the courts, she named Wakatu, for instance, or in her public address here today, or in gatherings such as that one at Waitangi almost four years ago, meeting with young lawyers of the Māori Law Society, who I have heard speaking in this very room of her words at that event. Whether discussing the Treaty of Waitangi or the Magna Carta, the angles of vision mingle past, presence, and imaginative futures not yet fully grasped, the spray of the future biting one's face indeed. And in an effortless address we've heard this evening, we've heard tell of the last prize of the Civil War, none other than that Civil War that started as long ago as August 1642, 
with the raising of a monarchical standard near Nottingham many years ago, as you know, and then the last prize occurring some centuries later in M against the Home Office. We've also had rich resonances with long lost friends. The references to other regarding behaviour resonates for many of us. The words of Michael Taggart, I remember him using those same words in person over a coffee in Woodward Street, just off Lambton Quay, uh, not long ago. The Chief Justice knows the power of narrating and re-narrating stories about the past that inform us in our diverse present, the tales of becoming and law. She asks us to think and rethink anew. A poet has said, tell me a story, make it a story of great distances and starlight. As seen in the lecture today, the Chief Justice has traversed distances and illuminated points in and through time with her customary generosity of spirit and temperament. In honour of that, therefore, I ask that you join me in saluting the Right Honourable Dame, Shana Elias, and supporting this vote of thanks in the customary way. Thank you.